welcome to church. It's uh, nice to have you with us. My name is Matt. And I'm James. How are you guys doing? Today, we're going to be continuing in our series on socially acceptable sins, and we're touching on the interesting and important topic of conflict avoidance. That's right. Uh, and what many of you might not know is that Matt and I actually have conflicts all the time. Uh, <gasps> I, know, I know, right? Uh, for example, we disagree over the new Star Wars show, The Mandalorian. It sucks. We disagree over the band Radiohead. They're great. We disagree about whether Captain America is a good character or not. Hey, that's not true. I like Captain America. I just don't like him as, as much as Wolverine, which is... Uh, clearly that, better character. They're very questionable. Anyway, there's all sorts of things that we talk about easily, but there's other conflict that's much harder to deal with, and there's a big temptation uh, within all of us just to avoid it. It's easier uh, to not deal with it, but that can be really destructive and unloving, and we're going to be spending some time thinking about that today. Uh, but first, we're going to sing. We are. We've got a couple of songs, as per usual. The first one uh, is familiar to us all, Amazing Grace. And then after that, uh, we're going to do a new song together, Shepherd. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Fee and Dave to lead us in those songs. Let's Thanks, sing together. Guys. Can't see. 
Thanks for leading us in those songs and we look forward to singing that new song again at the end of our service. Uh, recently I've been trying in my daily readings of the Psalms to turn those Psalms into prayers and this week I was looking at Psalm 90, uh, 39 and so this prayer that I've uh, written uh, that I'm going to lead us in in a moment is uh, based on that Psalm. So let's talk to God in prayer. Father God and gracious Heavenly Father, uh, even when we're trying not to sin, being careful with what we say and do, particularly then, uh, we're so aware of how hard it is not to sin and then how sinful we really are. A and to keep this in and to not acknowledge that to you, it's like, it's like a burning inside because, of course, you know our sinfulness. You, you know our failures and our guilt and our weaknesses they're the reason that we're all dying, because of your judgment on sin. Because of sin, our sin, our days are a mere hand's breath to you. A breath and we're gone. We need you to live and to breathe. We need you to forgive us if we're to live with you now and into eternity. So we put all our hope in you and in your son and his death and resurrection for us. Please Save us from all our sins and from the damaging consequences of our sin. Help us learn from the hardships we endure to see them as your fatherly discipline, as your love for us and opportunity to grow in our love for you. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Listen to our cry for help. Renew our hope in your love for us in Jesus and grant us again the comfort and strength of knowing your great and kind goodness to us in Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Our first announcement is that we've got our annual congregational meeting coming up after this service at 11am. So when this service wraps up, go and grab a coffee, uh, something to eat, and then come back uh, in time for that service. Note uh, the link in the email and in the Facebook feed that you would have received during the week and we'll see you at 11 o'clock. Kids, 
Uh, now it's time for you. We've got something special, a couple of familiar friends uh, coming to do the kid spot now. Hey kids, we're back, uh, coming at you again with another kid spot for uh, term two, getting you all lined up for that. Just us, just James and Lachlan, uh, not Surfer Steve and Lachlan. No Narrator Nigel or James. And no Country Carl either. Who's Country Carl? I don't recall saying Country Carl. Who's Country Carl? Righto, future kids uh, spot characters aside, let's play a game, Lucky. It's uh, Word Association. So uh, what I'm going to say is I'm going to say a word, and uh, you're going to say the first thing that comes to your head. Uh, kids playing along at home, shout your answers really loudly so I can hear them, and so that your parents send me a strongly worded text. Oh, cool. Works for me then. Awesome. Let's start. First word, quarantine. Ooh, uh, binging Netflix. No school. Awesome. No school, but you're a parent. Less awesome. Radiohead. Who's that? Yeah, uh, that's what I thought. Um, next one, multiple degrees. Mm, uh, fake news. Carrots give you night vision. Yep, fake news again. Real news. Fake news. Oh, what a feeling. Toyota. More smart, more safe. Mortine. Hotel. Trivago. Your best friend that starts with the J. Jesus. Best friend that starts with a J, but you can't say Jesus. Fine. James. Snare. Best friend that starts with a J, but isn't James Snare. Pass. I see how it is. Um, spreading good news. Mm. Oh, our missionaries. Missionary. What's a missionary, eh? A missionary is someone who goes places where people usually wouldn't hear about the good news of the Bible and then tells them all about God and Jesus. So does that mean that spreading God's word is kind of like a mission? Yeah, a little. Jesus does instruct us to tell people that he is king and died for their sins. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says, But the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you power. Then you will tell everyone about me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and everywhere in the world. Basically, Jesus is on a mission that cannot be stopped to let everyone know that he is king, and you and I are a part of that. Oh, well, yeah, that is really cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. And it's actually what the kids are going to be learning about today in another video coming up right after we speak. But before that... How about you and I do a little word association? I'll leave this time. Sure. Okay. Um, whoa. We're halfway there. Whoa. Living on a prayer. Yeah, great idea, James. How about you pray for us? Thanks, mate. Right, kids, so I'm going to lead us in prayer, so please bow your heads. Uh, dear God, thank you that you could all uh, bring us online uh, to this church service. Thank you that we could learn from your word and listen to you. Uh, I thank you for all the kids' church leaders and all the work that they've been doing, and especially thank you for Ash. Uh, I also pray that uh, as we go through this and um, all the time we spend in quarantine, that we would fix our eyes on you, and that uh, as we gradually start going back to school, that we'll enjoy our time at school and with our friends again. Uh, we also would like to thank you that uh, your word and your plan is unstoppable, and that um, we are a part of your unstoppable force. All these things we bring to you in prayer. Amen. Right, guys, see you later. Uh, thanks, guys. Again, we're going to sing, which is a wonderful thing to do as God's people. And so I'm going to hand it over to Fee and Dave uh, to lead us in our next song, Jesus is Alive.
Thanks, guys. Uh, what's going to happen now is that Phil is going to come and lead us in prayer. And then after that, Thomas will read to us from the Bible. And then after that, James will come and speak to us from that passage in Scripture and a number of other parts in the Bible on the topic of conflict avoidance. So I'll hand it over to Phil. Thanks, Phil. Hi, everyone. I'm Phil, and I'm going to pray to our wonderful God. Please join me in prayer. A wonderful Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings in recent months. We thank you that we can rely on you to be in control of all things, even though the COVID pandemic has meant we are living through very strange times. Please continue to help us to trust in your strength, even though we feel powerless. Please grant us your peace and remove all our anxieties. And please help us to love and support those around us, even though we need so much energy to look after ourselves. Please help us to keep seeing and enjoying all the wonderful ways that you bless us day by day. We especially thank you that things are slowly re returning to normal, or at least starting to. Please give us your wisdom and strength. Please give that wisdom and strength to our leaders, Scott Morrison and Gladys Berejiklian, as well as to everyone who is advising them through the current situation. Thank you that the actions taken so far have proven to be effective. As the restrictions start lifting, please help them make wise decisions which keep us all safe, 
as well as helping businesses start up again and helping people get back to work. Father, there are so many other struggles that we face and which might be forgotten when so much focus is put on the coronavirus. We pray for all those in our church who continue to suffer from illness and injury, whether that's physical or mental. Please make sure they get effective treatment. Please heal them and please give them your strength to carry them through their pain and to help them recover quickly. Father, we also pray for today's annual congregational meeting. We thank you that you have built this church, this small part of your worldwide family. Thank you for our leaders, for our ministry team, and for everyone who has given their time and energy to church this year. Please bless us in the year ahead and help this church to be a powerful witness to everyone on the Central Coast so that we can bring glory to you. We pray these things in the name of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello. Today's reading is Book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 4, 1 to 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy to the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned, this is why it says, When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower, earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and some and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will all in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together, by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Hi everyone. Let's start today by imagining a few scenarios that I'm pretty sure will sound familiar to many of us, either personally or relationally. Uh, let's meet Melanie. She's the sort of person that everyone thinks is great. She never causes any difficulty in her group of friends. She really values her relationships and her friends' feelings. So whenever she became upset with a friend, she'd say something to herself like, I'll just work through it on my own. Or say something like, I'm being too sensitive, or I'm sure they didn't mean it that way. But she kind of secretly still thinks that her friend did mean it that way. And it hurts. And so that low-level pain just sort of lingers with her. If a friend seemed cold or distant or upset with her, then Melanie would go out of her way to make that person feel better, until Melanie felt like that person warmed to her again and that things were okay. Or how about Brad? He's a confident guy at work, but he really struggles to bring up anything in his marriage that might upset his wife Chloe. He's afraid that if he criticizes her, she'll get angry and defensive, and he'd rather just not deal with it. He would bend over backwards to try and keep her happy, but because Chloe and Brad are human, eventually, despite his best efforts, it doesn't work. Sometimes he could deal and stay quiet, but occasionally he couldn't take it anymore, and he blows up. He starts to feel more and more distant from Chloe because he can never talk about his feelings, and she begins to avoid talking to him about his feelings because it seems like he always gets angry when he does. 
Brad's issues with Chloe weren't big ones, but because they never got addressed, they worked in his heart, poisoning his feelings towards her. Or how about Chanel? She runs a women's ministry at church, and she has lots of good ideas and is always looking to improve things. But she's critical of others, and interactions with her often leave people feeling hurt or unsettled. People feel bullied or attacked when they disagree with her, but no one, not even the church's leaders, are willing to talk to her about how she treats people. She does good work with organizing and teaching, but no one really seems happy to work with her. She always has an answer if someone does try to critique her, or when given feedback, she breaks down and talks about how no one understands how hard her job is. The result is that issues go unresolved. And people get hurt and just try to avoid as much direct contact with her as possible. These are all examples of conflict avoidance. But what is that? Well, conflict avoidance is the approach that lots of us take when we don't want to deal with an issue uh, that we have with someone else or a group of people. That conflict could be out there in the open uh, between two people, or it could be in our hearts as we think about that offense that we've been given by another or by a group. We could be avoiding conflict about a disagreement that we have about the best way to do things or to think about things, or it could be uh, that there is some sin between us. Concretely, uh, it looks like things like changing the subject whenever something tense comes up, or we find a way to delay or put talking about things off. We hide physically or figuratively, and we avoid a person or we keep our feelings or thoughts to ourselves. We might do this because we're fearful of upsetting someone or them attacking us. It might be because we're ashamed of our thoughts or embarrassed that we're being too sensitive. Lots of things can cause it. And there isn't even always a pattern with it. People who can do conflict at work can't do it with family. And some people who can talk through stuff at home can't do it at school or at the office. Some people, though, live terrified of conflict and seek to avoid it at all costs. Entire communities can begin to be affected, and instead of people being able to talk to each other directly, Everything has to be done by go-betweens and indirect communication. You know, things like someone told me or they said that and the result is lots of people feeling anxious about what everyone else is thinking. In church, this can be a particular issue because Christians know that they're meant to be loving and have peace. So instead of really addressing conflicts, either openly or in our hearts, uh, we just try not to rock the boat or upset anyone. But this type of approach can actually be really unloving and destructive. And that's why we're dealing with this topic of socially, we're dealing with this topic under the heading of socially acceptable sins. Lots of us uh, will be encouraged to not deal with issues that we have with each other in the name of peace or not causing trouble. But ultimately, as we're going to see from the scriptures, that can be way more unloving and disastrous for the people involved and the community around them than any difficulties that we have in actually dealing with the issue or conflict that we have. So, now that we know what conflict avoidance is, what we're going to do is look at God's exhortations on how we are to live towards one another. Then we're going to look at some examples of godly conflict in the Bible. Then we'll look at one biblical example of how destructive conflict avoidance can be. And then finally, we'll look at some brief pointers on how to do conflict well with some recommendations on where to go for more. So let's start with the basics about how God exhorts us to interact with and treat one another. The really big guiding light for how we treat others is Jesus' command for us to love our neighbor. To understand what love looks like, we're pointed to the example of Jesus himself. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 3.16, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So, Christian love involves sacrifice and caring for others. And alongside this general command to love, we have multiple exhortations in Scripture that we are to care for others more than for ourselves and to carry their burdens. So it says in Ephesians 4.2, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In 1 Corinthians 13, 7, Paul famously writes, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So, we are to love one another and bear with one another. Put all these verses together and you can start to get the sense that the Christian thing to do when we've got issues with people is simply to grin and bear it and endure the problems and let stuff go. But, it turns out that there were plenty of times that 
the guy who wrote these verses felt like it was necessary to have confrontation or risk a confrontation with others. And Jesus himself definitely did not unlovingly avoid confrontation. So let's look at some examples of good confrontation in the New Testament. First up, how about this example uh, from early in Jesus' ministry? Uh, now, up to this point in Luke's Gospel, there's been some questioning of Jesus and his disciples by the Pharisees, a particular religious group who was there at the time. They were questioning whether it was lawful under the rules in the Old Testament to pick heads of grain on the Sabbath, the day of rest. They were asking, does this count as work? Is it simple to do it? And Jesus answered that question, but then have a look at what Jesus does in response to that interaction when the Sabbath rocks around again. So this is from Luke chapter 6, verse 6. It says, On another Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life? Or to destroy it. He looked around at them all and then said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now, just think about this for a second. Get this, okay? Jesus knows there is an issue between him and the Pharisees. And what does he do? Avoid a conflict? No. He literally steps up in front of all of them, knowing their thoughts, and does something that he knows is going to upset them because he needed to teach the truth. Does he do so braggadociously? No. Does he do so to intimidate or inspire fear? No. In the Gospel of Mark's account of this story, it says that Jesus is angered and grieved at the hardness of their hearts, but his anger with them doesn't lead to violence against them, but healing for the man with the shriveled hand. He does conflict to achieve good and to rebuke the hard hearts of the Pharisees. But make no mistake, Jesus caused such a conflict that they started to plot about what they might do with him. Or how about Mark 11, where Jesus is aggressive, at least in his actions. This time, uh, he's in the temple, the holy house of the Lord, where people have started to set up shop to make money for themselves in exploitive ways. Does Jesus avoid confronting them for the wrong that they've done lest he hurts their feelings? No. It says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began to look for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. This is not conflict avoidance. Jesus isn't out of control. He isn't sinning. He's rebuking a sinful practice. Forcefully, yes, but importantly, with the authority to do so. It was, as he says, his father's house. And that's an important point that we should all remember before we start to forcefully confront someone else. But even with that note of caution for us, it's impossible not to see the seriousness of the conflict that Jesus entered into. The result of Jesus confronting these practices is that the religious leaders seek to kill him. Again, this is not conflict avoidance. Now, both of these are situations where Jesus is confronting those who are opposed to him. But so often the conflicts that we avoid as Christians occur between people who are in church with us. We get offended by something someone does or says, and instead of talking about it, we nurse that hurt or just try to avoid the person that we've been pained by. So what does Jesus do when his conflict is with those who are on his side? Let's look at Mark uh, chapter 4, verse 35 and onwards. It says, That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. 
The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, the disciples are frustrated with Jesus. And in this passage, they ask kind of crazily when you think about it, don't you even care if we drown? It's a question that has an inherent accusation in it. But does Jesus say, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. I never should have let that story, that that storm, you know, go crazy there. And I shouldn't have fallen asleep. Uh, does he maybe say nothing but silently see though that over how they've treated him or just say, you know what, it was kind of an intense situation. Maybe we just let this whole thing go. No, he confronts them and questions their fear and their lack of faith. And it's a good thing because it leads them to ask the right question. Who is this guy really? Now, this is just one of dozens of examples of Jesus doing this sort of thing with his disciples. There's an accusation or some sort of misunderstanding, and he speaks truth and love to it. Now, at this point, you might say to me, uh, James, aren't these all examples of Jesus, the Son of God? Of course, he's not going to be afraid of conflict, and, and he has the right to speak. He's the Lord of all, the sinless Messiah. Well, fair enough. But what about Paul and the way he speaks to his brother in Christ, the Apostle Peter, when Peter is in the wrong? In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he talks about meeting the apostles in Jerusalem and how it all went well, but afterwards, Peter starts to cave into pressure from people with wrong doctrine. He stops eating with his non-Jewish Christian brothers, and he leads others astray. Paul describes what happens next like this in Galatians 2.11. He says, But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas, my boy, was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, How can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, Peter, so Paul opposed Peter to his face because he knew Peter was making a mistake. He knew it was wrong. He knew it was hurting others. He even did this publicly because Peter's mistake was a public one that was confusing and misleading other people. Now, again, remember, Paul saying that Peter, that he opposed Peter to his face is not the same thing as saying that he got up in his face but it is showing us clearly that Paul wasn't avoiding conflict. He wasn't passively, aggressively trying to undermine him. He spoke to the issue at hand in a manner that best addressed this public problem. See, Paul understood, as Jesus did, that there is value in speaking directly and clearly with one another in order to love each other and in order to love the people around us who will be hurt if issues between us are allowed to continue to go unchecked. I mean, just think for a moment. What would the result have been uh, for all the Gentiles watching what Peter was doing if Paul had just said, oh, you know what, I don't want to hurt Pete's feelings. And look, he does get a little testy sometimes. That's just who he is. I'm sure it'll be fine. Let's not make a big deal. So, looking at some of these biblical examples, I think that there's a real positive case that we can make that we should communicate directly and clearly with one another, even in difficult situations and that avoiding conflict isn't necessarily the loving way to go. But because we are so conflict adverse, I think we also need to understand how unhealthy it can get when because of a fear of conflict, or because we are ashamed or embarrassed, that we avoid doing it. Unhealthy isn't even a strong enough word to describe some situations. Destructive would be a better word. So let's look at a biblical example of conflict avoidance causing real destruction. We've been encouraging people uh, this week at Gospel PC to read the sad story of King David and his son Absalom in 2 Samuel 13 through 18. It's too much for me to go through in detail, but I want to give you a quickish rundown of some of the horrible things that happen. In brief, uh, the story occurs at the height of King David's power and influence. The nation of Israel is secure, but David has already begun to sow the seeds of trouble for himself with his taking of Bathsheba and his wife and the murder of her husband Uriah. 
At this time, David's sons from his first wives are full grown, and they're about to start one heck of a family conflict and tragedy. In 2 Samuel 13, we're told that Amnon, the son of David's second wife, falls in love with his half-sister Tamar. Amnon horribly rapes Tamar and earns the fury of both Tamar's full brother Absalom, the son of David's first wife, and David himself. But David does nothing. And Absalom does not confront David to seek justice for his sister. And probably because of David's inaction and lack of confrontation, Absalom never confronts Amnon either. It says in 13.22 that Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Can anyone say conflict avoidance? Two years later, however, Absalom has Amnon killed. Absalom flees, not a confrontation with David, and David does not pursue him, not a confrontation with Absalom. In 2 Samuel 14, David's friend and advisor Joab sets up an elaborate ruse uh, using a woman to pose as a supplicant, bringing up the issue of Absalom with David. Again, a massive non-confrontation by Joab because of David's non-confrontation issues. The result is that Joab's craftiness uh, works and Absalom is brought back to Jerusalem, but he re- David refuses to talk to him for two years. Frustrated, uh, Absalom finally tries to meet with Joab, uh, but Joab says, I'm not going to meet with you because of David's stuff. So Absalom does what any reasonable person would do and sets fire to Joab's field to get his attention, to get him to talk to David about talking to him. This crazily kind of works and David and Absalom have a reconciliation of sorts but we're not told of any ongoing communication between them and honestly with everything we've read it seems unlikely. After a little while Absalom starts to act like he's the king and begins to win the hearts of the people but David again does nothing to stop him. Absalom conspires to take the throne and he does so and this time David flees the city. Eventually In chapter 18, we're told about David's plans to retake the city, but he commands his leaders, be gentle with the young man Absalom for David's sake. And in the ensuing combat, 20,000 of God's people die. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that all conflict avoidance will lead to the death of 20,000 people. And I get that this is an extreme example. But so great is our tendency to avoid conflict at times that I think we need an extreme reminder that conflict avoidance can be just as destructive as conflict. And that's because conflict avoidance doesn't actually get rid of conflict. It just either takes the conflict from being out there and puts it in our heart to slowly poison us or we set it up to explode later, or we launch secret wars against the people that we have conflicts with in a passive-aggressive way. So the million-dollar question is, if we're saying that conflict is sometimes a good and godly thing, how do we do it well? Now, look, I've got to say, I can only begin to trace a theological outline for how to do this in the time we have left. If you're already on board with conflict avoidance, this will probably leave you thinking, well, there's so much more, and you're right. Uh, There's a skill to addressing conflicts that people pay big money to go away on retreats and learn. So I don't want to oversell what we can do now. Uh, And if you're just beginning to come to terms with conflict avoidance that we need to do this, uh, you're going to need to delve further into this than we've got time for today. Uh, If you go to the comments section on the Facebook page uh, for this video, you can find links to some resources or you can copy down some of these titles to get more info. So think of this as just the start, just laying the groundwork for more change to come. So uh, to think about doing conflict well, let's look at Ephesians 4. Paul says at the start of that chapter, as we've already heard, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Then, later in the chapter, he writes that as we grow together in unity and maturity in Christ, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men, in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. When we have unity and maturity, 
we speak the truth in love. In this context, we do this so we won't be fooled by false doctrine, nor the deceitfulness of people. But the result is that we grow up more and more into Jesus supporting one another as we build each other up and work together. But remembering where Paul starts the chapter, if we are genuinely going to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, then we have to speak the truth in love and not simply avoid conflict. But what is this truth that we're meant to speak? I mean, obviously there's true things, not, you know, facts, not falsehood. But I think there's, there's more to it than this. At least we can take a different angle. So Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. Now, I don't mean that in the sense that Jesus is always the answer to a question you get in Sunday school about the Bible, you know, God, Jesus, the Bible. I'm not talking about that sort of truth. I mean, he is the most real thing. He is the truest thing. And he is the source of all that is good and true in this world because all things were created and made through him. So what does it look like when we have a, a conflict to speak the truth in love? What does it look like for me to speak Jesus, God's word, and the gospel? Now, there'll be all sorts of answers uh, to this question. Some conflicts exist in your heart right now. And what speaking the truth, what speaking Jesus in love looks like is to say, I need to believe the best about that person. They didn't mean it. It was a once-off. And I need to forgive them as Jesus has forgiven me. And maybe even check in on them and see if they're doing okay. Sometimes the conflict uh, will exist in our heart, but that's because there's been an ongoing pattern of someone sin sinning against us. And we've been forgiving them, but the issue just keeps happening. So we need to not only forgive them, we then need to graciously and generously explain what we've been seeing and then ask that person who's been sinning against us, what's going on? Give them a chance to explain themselves. Maybe we prepare ourselves to, to meet with some anger or something like that, but continue to extend grace to them. Because again, if we're speaking the truth, if we're speaking Jesus and we're speaking the gospel, then we're speaking the grace at all times that I've sinned, you've sinned. Let's work this out. Which applies when sometimes the conflict's out in the open. And the issue is that you're mad at somebody and they're mad at you. And you've got different ideas about what the issue is. And speaking the truth in love means saying, listen, I've sinned. I've been mad at you. I've not been gracious, and I'm asking you to forgive me. But we've got an issue here, and it doesn't glorify God or fit with the gospel for us to keep going like this. So is there any way we can work it out? What do you need me to hear? How have I wronged you? And then we can say, this is how I feel like what you've been doing has hurt me. And maybe, just maybe that person moved by the Spirit says, you know what? I've sinned against you too. Please forgive me. But sometimes doing conflict well means coming with a gospel heart, asking for forgiveness and speaking the word of Christ. And yet we're met with stubbornness or hardness of heart or unforgiveness. And you or the other party, depending on the context and relationship, has to walk away. And that's actually the best outcome that we can hope for in this world. Because even though it's a sad outcome, at least by dealing with the conflict, at least by stopping the ongoing, the ongoing sin or the, the problem that it's hand, even if we don't reckon, reach reconciliation where we're back in close relationship to each other, at least we've stemmed the bleeding and stopped spilling into the rest of the community. How much better would the conflict in Israel have gone if David had confronted Absalom or Amnon early and dealt with the issue at hand? When the leaders are the people who are sinning or causing issues, it's even more important to address it, to deal with it, to work it through. It can't go unspoken of and avoided. The last thing I want to say is this. We need to see conflict as an opportunity for the gospel to do what the gospel does. When we speak the truth in love, then we can have hope for unity and maturity, the fullness of that. It's, it's hard. It's not fun. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be uncomfortable. But for love for one another, that's what really bearing one another, bearing one another in love looks like. Where I take on the burden that you have hurt me and I have hurt you, but praise God for the gospel that's given us the tools that we need to work through this. And not just the tools, but the spirit, which is the power of God to bring reconciliation, to end conflict. 
Jesus' work on the cross, that conflict led to him paying the price for us so that our conflict with God can be ended by the forgiveness that he gives to us and to all who believe in him. We need to see conflict not as a disastrous thing to be avoided at all costs, but something to look at as something the gospel answers, that the gospel can speak to our conflict and it can bring hope and life to even the most broken of situations. And even in those situations where true reconciliation on that deep gospel level isn't possible in this world, that we still honor and glorify God by seeking to do the best that we can to be reconciled. And that maybe we can't recover and retrieve what was lost, but at least we can act in a way that honors God and brings glory to him with the hope that when he returns and he remakes this world, that all conflicts that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ can be ended as we all come to the fullness of forgiveness and glorification that we have in him. So let's stop being afraid of conflict. Let's see it for the opportunity that it is to let the gospel do what the gospel does, to bring peace, unity, and maturity to all of us. Let's keep reading. Let's keep getting equipped. Let's keep talking about this and change the culture so that we're a community where we don't avoid conflict. We deal with it to grow into Jesus more and more, supporting one another as part of his body. I'm going to pray for that now. Father God, thank you so much for sending Jesus into this world to die on the cross and pay the price for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that through what he has done, the conflict between us and you has been put to an end when we believe and trust in Jesus and all he's done for us. Father, please help us not to avoid conflict, not to run away from it, but to see it as an opportunity for us to be reconciled to one another through the gospel, for the gospel to do what it does, to bring people together, to bring peace, to bring unity and maturity. Please, Lord, may we not act as infants, avoiding conflict, hiding from one another when there's issues and hard things. Rather, Lord, may we act as mature saints, secure in the gospel that we have been forgiven and that we can extend forgiveness to others also, that we can talk about our problems, that we can live out the gospel by the power of your spirit. Lord, help us to do this when it's uncomfortable, when it's painful, when it's hard. Help us to grow through these things so we become more and more like your son Jesus, the Prince of Peace and the ultimate ender of all conflict. And we thank you for this in his name. Amen.
Thanks, guys, for leading us in that song. And thank you to everybody who has contributed to the service this morning. We really appreciate your efforts. And thanks, James, uh, for walking us through the scriptures and uh, what the Bible says about speaking the truth in love and particularly as that relates to conflict. Uh, really important and good stuff to take on board. Yeah, pleasure. It really is important and I'm looking forward to doing it all together. It's going to work well. Uh, just a quick reminder that remember, we do not have the regular Zoom catch up that we would have after church most mornings. Uh, today we've got the ACM that's going to be starting at 11 o'clock. So got just a few minutes to get yourself a cup of tea or a coffee and get ready for that. Uh, don't, don't forget to wear your funny hat. Mm -hmm. I am very excited. I've got a cool one I'm going to be busting out. Uh, and we're going to do some church business together. It's going to be really encouraging. So please come along uh, and join us for that. Yep. It'd be good to see you there. See you soon. See ya.